So we will split this talk in two. I will first talk about why the, a paradigm change might be needed in education. And then Nick is going to take over and explain how we actually, um, at the very concrete and very practical level, teach the course that we do teach together. Um, in the first part, I would like to provide some motivation uh, for introducing transition design education. And then some background, because uh, this is not the first um, kind of education that's trying to um, change what we teach and how we teach, not at the level of, of um, uh, the practical and course design, but at the level of meaning. So a little bit more abstract um, type of thing. And then, as I said, Nick will take over and he will um, explain how we teach our course, and then we have discussion. So, Tony Fry is one of my uh, favorite authors, and in the conversation quite a long time ago, he said, we are finite uh, beings living on a finite planet with finite resources that we squander at the speed of light in geological terms. So, I couldn't agree with this uh, statement more, and about the same time, I started looking, uh, me being an educator, how do I do education? What do I do? in my courses, how do I prepare for them, um, what is sustainable about them and what's not, and so how can I change uh, the way I teach. And this came to mind, um, he said, we behave like there is no tomorrow, and I thought, okay, maybe we also educate like there is no tomorrow. We educate in the same way. So can we, can we kind of um, change what we are interested in in terms of education? And in particular, uh, I asked a question recently when we introduced this new course, how to uh, transition interaction design education so that the graduate become part of the solution rather than part of the problem? Because interaction design in itself uh, is not very sustainable. It does what Terry described as looking for solutions like a silver bullet that solve the problem. I don't know, you have a health uh, service that you need to design, you go and you, require, you, you inquire how to collect um, user requirements and how to identify the needs. You design the system and you don't think much further than that. It was the same as being an educator, it was the same. I have a course that I teach, I teach it every year, I uh, deliver on, on um, outcomes that we say at the introduction of the course, students will learn this, this, this and this, we have a course book, we cover this material, and so I was wondering, well, is that actually enough? And so um, <clears throat> I started looking at alternatives to traditional education. So the first one is um, engaged scholarship. This started about 25 years ago, and um, <clears throat> a bunch of researchers got together and they decided that uh, the values are primary in education also, so the education should be something that's deeply connected to the society and to social justice and citizenship as main uh, values that one needs to focus on. Um, so engaged scholarship was mainly focused on research, but also teaching. Uh, looking at all the production, all the research paper that people, papers that people have written about uh, engaged scholarship, you see that um, there is an idea that um, education needs to engage deeper with social problems, and that the students also need to engage deeper with uh, social problems in society. Rethinking what the mission of the university is, uh, I have to say I have been teaching for many years without ever thinking what is university strategy, what is the university role in the society, how does university fulfill that role. And so this got me thinking, okay, uh, the university mission is actually to um, contribute to solving social problems. And if you look at it that way, then uh, many things fall into place. And um, university serves as a vehicle to provide support to me to engage into the social problems. And they also should provide me with logistical support to do so. And um, uh, there should be some sort of reward, reward 
in terms of concrete results and outputs that you can see from this partnership and, and collaboration that come out. In terms of the society, when you focus on these values of social justice and citizenship, you see that these require, those are what Terry and what um, Don has, have talked about, um, you see that you have to work transdisciplinarily, you have to cross borders between disciplines and work together. There are certain community needs uh, that uh, one can identify and one can um, cater to, but there is also uh, knowledge democratization. This is very much what Dan talked about when you engage and in, in partnership and in participatory manner, um, discover what you want to do and where you need to go <laughs> with your processes. And finally, there has to be some kind of reciprocity between what communities get and what uh, educators, students, and university get. Um, and in all of this, of course, it still remains important that you have quality scholarship, which means that your research is of good quality because we, um, as academic people, often take our um, work to be primarily research, and then teaching is something you do as part of being there. But actually, teaching is a great thing, a great opportunity for real change. Um, you have seen Terry talk about COVID and about how they went to change uh, and educate the, the public. Well, how do we educate designers about what is happening today? One obvious way is through education, but then you have to really rethink how this works. I'm now trying to, yeah. Um, the second um, effort to change education could be called transdisciplinarity. And it's uh, about creating holistic approach to complex problems, so very much in line with transition design. But um, has been around for quite a long time. And as uh, researchers, we probably can tell you it's not easy to do. Uh, Amela has asked questions, yeah, but how do you explain to the economists that you need this and this so that you can make some progress on whatever, um, uh, whatever problem you're looking at? It is really not easy to do so. However, uh, with wicked problems, single disciplinary knowledge is never going to be enough, so we have to do this. So transdisciplinarity is here to stay and we just need to get used to the fact and find out how to work with it. This is difficult, so I will just skip. <laughs> and then there is a third um, uh, direction of how people thought they should introduce some values into education. And it's uh, the responsible education that was first suggested in 2007 by um, United Nations in Initiative um, uh, and they, it was related to management education, that's why it's called Principles of Re Responsible Management Education. But uh, looking at these principles, which actually cons uh, consist of uh, purpose, purpose of project of what you're doing, of values, you as a designer, also values that the project brings on, methods, research, partnership, and dialogue that um, you engage different parties in during these processes, uh, they actually are uh, quite universal. So there's nothing about management education that um, is claiming exclusive rights to these values. They are absolutely um, valid for broader context of education. Okay, as I said, I am um, an interaction designer and I do teach interaction design. And so uh, about 10 years ago, we started thinking about how to change and introduce um, uh, interaction design studies. With Amela, we designed kind of a research through design approach to look at how we change the values in our course and how do we co-create uh, values through partnership with industry. And so we had huge courses and we um, had lots of partners that were involved in, uh, in this. And um, we wanted everyone to be happy with the results. So going beyond what, what um, 
participating organizations want, like they come and they say to students, we want you to develop a website. No. You allow the students to be in dialogue and conversation with you, and then whatever happens, they design something possibly novel, possibly. But it wasn't about needs and identifying needs and helping organizations to fulfill them necessarily. I mean, it took us a while to, to, to come up with a framework and uh, to look at how do we um, introduce values to um, interaction design. And then I, uh, there is also um, sustainable interaction design that has influenced a lot uh, our work. Um, it designed for equity, design uh, value-driven design, uh, justice and social responsibility, and pr probably also the STEAM uh, model of education that introduces the A stands for art and design into uh, transdisciplinary education uses science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, so. And transdisciplinarity in, in interaction design is also quite important. Um, there has been a lot of talk within the field. Uh, what does it mean, really? Um, and it's very uh, well known, that's also the title of our uh, talk, as this word paradigm. Uh, there are three well-established paradigms within interaction design that had to do with cognitive modeling, that had to do with usability, that had to do with user experiences. And now everyone in the field more or less feels, yeah, it's time to change the paradigm again. And there have been several suggestions of uh, what this new paradigm should be. So one of the suggestions is uh, transdisciplinarity. Another is uh, entanglement between society, technology, and research. And so all of this together, I think that um, what is clear is that there is a need to educate students to understand better how to work with transdisciplinarity how to work with um, partnerships, how to work with values, how to work uh, or what the purpose of a project that they have means to them and so on. Okay. Um, and so also we at Oslo were not the first one to think of teaching uh, transition design, although I'm not sure I'm doing it at all by the model of CMU. And it's not important because we start where we are and we work from... Um, whatever projects we have and topics that we have. And we don't work necessarily at this very high systems level, but we work with, with these values and ideas behind transition design that I think can be imported into any kind of field and um, leverage to provide better education to students. So that is the idea here, and so uh, yes, there is CMU and there is many universities that started offering courses based on values, based on, um, maybe they don't call it responsible education, maybe don't, they don't call it engaged scholarship, maybe they don't call it transition design education, but this idea that I have been talking about, uh, they are appearing, emerging in different ways, in different uh, courses in design, interaction design, and probably also other disciplines, because some of these directions that I mentioned, like engaged scholarship or uh, responsible um, research and education, they were from business and management and uh, economy or um, other disciplines, not necessarily design. And so we started three years ago offering a course in transition design. And I think maybe this you have already seen, and uh, we try to use this framework not as a framework for transition design and talk about systemic change and you know all of these huge things, but in a, as a kind of a design tool or <coughs> tool for designers to reflect on their own values, mindset, and posture, define it for themselves, look at the visions for transition, look at this futuring aspect of what they are doing. Um, think about how they could use some theories of change or how they could come up with their own theory of change, how their solution can become um, more impactful and maybe uh, 
seen by others, more visible, more impactful, more meaningful. Um, and then the new ways of designing that have to do maybe with this uh, uh, sensitivity to where you place your interventions, how you go about them, which partnerships you find and how you define them and um, how you solve the problems that you're looking at. And um, I think after this I switch to Nick, if I'm not mistaken, but yeah. I would just like to... <laughs> I would just like to say that our students will present later, and you will see these projects are nothing at the grand scale, like, uh, you know, studying um, uh, some sort of global communication systems. They are starting at different levels, um, of both engagement, partnerships, and um, possible solutions, but they do go through these steps of this framework to think through them and um, to propose what they want to work with. And yes. Nick will explain what we did to work with this. Thank you, Alma. So yes, uh, Alma's gone through the, the sort of the, the why we're doing it, and I'm sort of going about a little bit more about how we, how we approach it. And uh, so we sort of go through this spiral method where we introduce the, the material a number of times, first very, very, very briefly, just to get them to hear the terms and understand how they might fit together, what's coming up next. And then we go through it a little bit more thoroughly, where they can sort of work with it and get to use it a little bit. And then thirdly, we go through it again once they've used it and they have some opinions and are able to reflect on it. Um, we also are very, um, it's all about teamwork, both in the teams that the students generate, but also that team working in collaboration with their, uh, their partners in the projects. Um, and it's very much about these, these projects which we have, which are real projects that the students work on as well. Real, I say, they're working with real collaborators um, that the, the projects don't necessarily turn into anything in the end, but they are real in the sense that they have a, a, a collaborator. Um, and they all sort of, in their own way, deal with this level of complexity and look at ways in which they could scale up their projects to be more impacting. So uh, these are the four projects that we worked on this year. Uh, you probably can't read them. But I'll just briefly mention them, but also there will be uh, presentations from pretty much all the four projects later. But we had Relink, which was a project looking at the ways in which people understand how smart homes might access or use personal data and how we might work with those understandings to sort of move to better uh, ways of, of obtaining data and using that data. We had uh, a project working with NIS, which is Nordic International Support, looking at getting youth involved in uh, more sustainable ways of, of clothing. Uh, we also had a project with uh, Oslo Children's Museum, looking at, again, younger children this time, but looking at engaging them in some meaningful topics. And we also had a project that Amala, I think, might speak about later, which is Access Tour, which is looking at ways of opening up tourism to people that have some sort of disability or a um, requirement. So, so these are some of the teaching elements that we, that we utilise in the course. Um, and some of these, or most of these, I will go through more thoroughly uh, in the subsequent slides as to why, why we tackle them and why we feel they're appropriate. But some of the things we look at are time and temporality, teamwork, purpose, engagement, partner and project selection, some sort of mastery of approach and methods, ontological effects of design, ecological thinking, systems thinking, futures-oriented design, and values. So, <clears throat> now I'm going to go a little bit more into why we tackle those specific teaching elements. And so with systems thinking, it's, it's often that students um, understand the need for more sustainable ways of, of, of living and being, but it's very difficult for them to see how it might relate uh, directly to what they might 
work on in their subsequent futures and their subsequent careers. So we, we sort of provide them systems thinking, approaches, giga mapping, and leverage points and things like this to enable them to see how they might uh, affect some changes in their future careers. Um, it's also sort of works on two levels. One, it exposes them to see how they uh, are possibly able to affect these things, but it also sees or makes them aware of the large uh, problems that pertain to their area of, of choice. Um, so yeah, and by working on very real projects, it again allows them to understand these connections much more upfront. Um, but also working on these local projects also allows them to start building a, a network of like-minded individuals and organizations that are also looking at ways in which they could transform society. So I think that's really beneficial for these people that are starting off in their, in their careers. So another aspect we, that we try and um, uh, engage the students with is the ontological approach of design. So this is sort of the far-reaching effects that design has on a society. And we try and reveal those connections between those societal issues and, and the students' future projects. But this often leads to some sort of overwhelming realization of, of some of the, the nature of these problems. So there's a number of common responses that the students have. Uh, a typical response is, we need to tackle everything. Another one is some sort of withdrawal of, okay, well, my easiest option is to not design anything, and specifically nothing physical. Um, or there's often a, some sort of defiance as well. It's like, well, yes, it's difficult. Other people develop it in this way, so why can't we? Um, and we, we believe that sort of by showing them uh, the power of design and, and the ways in which design can influence behavior and society, that it provides a more meaningful response, uh, an alternate and more meaningful response more useful uh, response for the students to use. Um, and hopefully it gets uh, considered in their other future projects that you know, are not necessarily transition related, but to see these, this sort of effect of their implementations and how they ripple through society. So another aspect that we focus on is this sense of purpose and values. And um, often in these larger um, societal sort of problem-based projects, it's very difficult to see how to navigate through a project. Some of their traditional methods of navigating through projects might not work. So typically you might use a client to help you navigate through a project, some sort of user research, or maybe you're working on some new form of technology, and you can use that to help guide you through a project. But often in these larger, more societal, uh, future-based projects, those are not really useful. So one thing that we sort of um, try and instill in the students is this idea that they can use their own team values or sense of purpose to actually use as a navigation method through the project. And this this sort of works in both ways. Sometimes the students have a very strong uh, sense of uh, purpose with the project and can use it. Other times, um, it often happens that this is the period where they begin to uh, come up with a clear value for their team project. And, and as I say here, it's, this is sort of quite in contrast to typical projects where designers sort of tend to push their feelings away from a project. It's not about us, it's about the user. But in transition designs, the user is also the designer, and the designer is the user. We're all involved. Um, and as I mentioned here, this is... Um, oh, actually, so yeah, what we find is that this... Having this strong sense of, of a value or a purpose also 
allows the students to sort of resist some of this early temptation with um, sort of very uh, simplistic ideas or concepts that they early in the project come up with. Um, and it sort of seems that if you've got this strong sense of purpose that they are more resistant to adopting those too early. So it works quite well in that respect. Um, and that was the point I mentioned earlier, that often, if they are unclear here, this is normally where it becomes more apparent, this sense of purpose. Uh, mastery of uh, research and uh, approaches. So, um, as I sort of mentioned, a lot of established approaches um, tend to be used when they're working in these uncertain areas. And a number of them uh, work quite well, but um, we also need to obviously supply them with some new uh, methods and approaches. And we also need to do this in a method that's sort of considerate of time, both that gives them time to use those new methods, but also that's at an appropriate time in the project. Um, opportunity, i.e. the opportunity to, to utilise it, and uh, with a lack of bias, and that's sort of a bit more difficult. We've, we've found that a number of times that we implement um, new methods that for many reasons, some become more uh, taken hold of by the students than others. And it might be that they are slightly more easy to implement at the time. Um, and I think that those sorts of things we've become very aware of subsequently, that we've introduced things and we've sort of found that they've latched onto these things that are very easy to implement, but not necessarily most appropriate. And also we need to provide them with a variety of these new uh, methods. And one thing that we've found works quite well is that we've actually used an appropriate method itself, which is workshopping, to um, get the students uh, involved in a number of new methods at once. So we, we provide the students with a number of different methods and then we, with their groups, they all take one method each which they then learn over a small period of time and they then teach all the others in the, uh, in the class those groups via a workshop. So it's a, for, for many of them, this method of workshopping itself is a new method so that's an additional um, method that they've learnt, but also afterwards they're now a bit more competent and had a bit more exposure to a number, or in this case, this year, it was six new methods that they'd learnt. So, and they also have some people in the class that they can then go and refer to who are a bit more sort of in-depth uh, in that task. Um, and future-oriented visions. So. Obviously, this is quite important in, um, in the area of transition design. And as I've said, that, and as uh, Dan has already sort of mentioned, that establishing broad-reaching, realistic, engaging visions is difficult. Um, and and uh, attempts that I, I find that attempts are quite often based on, uh, or sort of, very simplistic attempts are based on these contestable assumptions and are of, of, um, often unrealistic or they're quite derivative and simplistic. So in order to, um, to sort of combat these, we provide them with some um, background in speculative design methods. And one of the papers is actually Dan's paper, Dan and Stuart Candy's paper, Methods of Visioning. Um, in order to sort of try and get them to, to sort of look a bit further into the speculative end of things, but and also we uh, also look at the more mundane, everyday life of, so we, we uh, familiarise them with the reconstitution of everyday life by Gideon Kosov, and we also introduce them to theory of needs by Max Neef, so that they can use the two together these very sort of more speculative uh, visions, but then tie them into everyday life to make them more accessible to everyone, so that they're much more engaging and much more realistic. 
Um, and again, working on real life projects also helps ground those much more realistically. Uh, time and temporality. So, yeah, transition projects work on long time frames. And the way that we tackle these long time frames is actually by, um, by working with the smaller projects which have real fixed time frames. So that allows the students to work and structure things on these smaller time frames but then some of their larger concepts could be tied into a longer time frame as well. But it gives them a way to sort of work with both of these. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, it allows them to tie in these longer time frames. Okay, and then another, another thing we look at is this shifting levels of engagement, which uh, Terry was talking about, is like trying to tie in these projects and work at multiple levels and having a richness or an ecosystem of, of projects. Um, and transition design projects are obviously large and complex, and the traditional way of detailing an entire project to create a seamless, unified, and consistent outcome is just simply not realistic, especially for the students involved and the time frames involved. So, so what we try and do is to get the students to work with existing aligned initiatives that can provide this extra depth and are mutually beneficial to their projects. So that they're not therefore designing the whole thing, but they're designing aspects of it which link into these other, other ecosystems. And again, the working on real local projects provides this uh, an opportunity provides them an opportunity to work on how they might start to uh, sort of design these more organic processes of working with existing initiatives. And this moves projects into the sort of the upper right quadrant of this um, this the winter house project uh, matrix of social pathways. So um, the top right quadrant talks about the, there's much more sense of impact in the top right quadrant, much more sense of engagement, but it also requires um, much more cross-sector involvement from lots of people, lots of teams. Um, and then another point on systems thinking. So, yeah, interaction design is a, is a mediation between people and technology. And design is often discussed as very innovative, new, cutting-edge, novel. And this can lead to very, very technology-heavy um, approaches in the outcomes of the students. And um, the, I think that one of the downsides of this is the requirements of this technology approach are often underestimated and the benefits are overestimated. And that in itself is problematic, but also it's to the detriment of other more appropriate methods and people, infrastructure and initiatives that are already abound, around that could be better used. Um, so hopefully this systems thinking allows people to see those already in existence and utilize those as part of the, the, this ecosystem and strengthen both projects. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Nick. Uh, and Anna, uh, are there any questions on Nick or Anna? For both of them. Okay, I have one question, which is maybe weird because I'm not part of the uh, part, of the, part of the course. But uh, uh, actually, you were talking about like a lot of like thematical topics, ontological designing and stuff like that, which are like more. And also mentioned uh, that uh, the form of the course are like more the most sort of workshop stuff and stuff like this. But tradition design is also about the theory, and I'm thinking about this like balance of forms of teaching 
you are using at the course, so... What the type of... Yeah. Shall I? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I, of course, uh, forgot to mention from the start, this is a bachelor course. So these students are not um, uh, master or PhD students, they are bachelor students. Um, and they have had some previous interaction design courses, so they have learned uh, typical interaction design literature, theories, and so on and so forth. So here we actually want to balance mm, the theory and the, um, the project work as needed to understand where we are trying to take them. And it's not so very simple because um, it feels ambiguous, it feels overwhelming, it feels... And so to make them also read new stuff that is kind of foreign, because they usually don't read philosophy papers, they don't read, uh, you, uh, you know, system systemic theories and um, not even making design theories. How do you make uh, design theories? So it's, it's not the typical of occupation they have. So we have selected small number of papers that are of theoretical nature and we try to go through these papers with students and we try to experiment with forms of um, inquiry if they have read and understood. For example, we have debates where somebody argues for some point or somebody argues against a point and we uh, also try kind of discussions in class, prepare questions uh, about the material that you have read and theories and, and we try to work on how can you implement this in your project. So they have concrete projects and they have abstract theories. How do these theories work uh, to push up your project, to make it better? Any other questions? I was going to ask, um, yeah, really, really interesting. Because both yeah, Anna and, and Nick, amazing to see all the kind of like intricate kind of even the responses, like how the students react to certain things, what are the issues that come up, and all of that. Do you think how like, I don't know how many years you've been using running this as a kind of approach, but have you seen that once they graduate and go into jobs in you know either in industry or with mm. social bodies? Are they a different type of designer? Like, are they actually kind of? Do they go into teams with all these methods and with this different? Like to you. We have a pretty terrible follow-up system. I have <laughs> so we don't follow alumni, but we do know um, that a lot of uh, increasingly many students try to take masters courses and they show up in our research. We teach research through design together as well. So we typically see uh, a part of the student uh, generations from yeah. bachelor to master. And I can partly answer it. <laughs> uh, I have uh, the students take master and then they got jobs. Yeah. And I can say that my master students working on this project, really in this project, they are always on the first pages of the newspaper. Okay. Like I interviewed okay. them, okay. like, oh, what you have learned with uh, at the Department of Informatics and what kind right. of job you are working. So there I'm really yeah, proud. That's good, yeah. I'm really <laughs> proud. <laughs> so there is some, but we could have done a lot more there actually to but there are so do some you know, We'll do with you. We'll keep a relation and you'll tell us what she's doing. And I have them on LinkedIn and I kind of push their master thesis on many generations new questions. You should have done this. So I think it's works. Okay. Yeah, okay. Last question, please. Uh, I wanted to ask you, because you were talking about some students who withdraw and who like, lose their motivation, so uh, if you could like uh, talk more about how do you keep other students motivated and engaged and really make them yeah, not burn out and well, I think that the the fact that they th so throughout this process they always have um, right at the very start of the semester they are um, assigned to a, a group project to work on. So they in in that respect they can't withdraw, but also we're there for them and we understand that it is quite overwhelming. 
um, for them. So um, it is sort of difficult at some stages, but, but we can work with them to sort of um, come to some sort of uh, arrangement as to what, what projects they would like to work on um, to develop that. Um, it's, yeah, and mostly it seems to work, is, is, is just sort of, I think the, one of the biggest things is, is that feeling that, um, yeah, it, that they, they sort of assume that everyone else knows how to do it or something. And then when they realise that, no, no, I think we're all in this together, we're all sort of finding space and finding out how it's done, then that is actually quite liberating. And, and so I think that what, that's what they sort of need, is just sort of a little bit of support in that, in that time to, to uh, sort of figure out the best way forward. Um, so hopefully that's what we, we provide. <laughs> yeah, if, I, uh, if I can add, you can ask the students. I mean, I'd be curious to yeah, hear what they have to true. say to this topic. <laughs> no. uh, but I, I, what we have seen is that uh, when they come to the course, it feels quite different than with other courses that they have had so far. So it's, it is a paradigm change for, for the students. It is thinking much bigger and being much more uncertain and Know, whatever that brings for some insecurity, for some uh, excitement, because it's a new opportunity to make something uh, radically different. Uh, I took a couple of discussions because we are a little bit the microphone. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>